You guys are early getting going. Um, you know, yesterday, I have been in town actually, yesterday was an amazing day with the flooding across eastern Washington that we've seen in the past couple of weeks right here in Okanagan County. Um, I'm glad you all can make it here safely. I think it's an important time to be here because when I think about Okanagan County and how beautiful this place is, I mean, from the wildfires that are gracing the hills, the beautiful forests, to the waterways, um, I also know that this community is one that faces significant challenges amongst that beauty. Um, I think of it oftentimes in the context of wildfire and forest health. I didn't think about it in the context of flooding. Um, this is a flood they haven't seen in their community since 1972. Um, and for some of you, you actually can go back that far. For some of you else, you can't. But the, it's something that they um, are really struggling with. And what breaks my heart in this whole context is that as soon as flooding season's over, right, and we're looking still at a number of weeks, we're already in fire season. Okanagan County's already seen a 300-acre fire in the beginning of April. Um, and that, that's just become the reality for this community, frankly, for this region and for our state of really moving from one challenge and crisis to another. I will say I'm honored and blessed to represent and serve with uh, over 1,500 people at DNR. Um, we sent 175 of our firefighters to help out with that community a few weeks ago to begin doing the sandbagging. They have been filling bags, placing those sandbags, helping pump out water from people's basements. Um, we also sent over 100 of our camp's crew to help um, make sure that that community was strong and healthy. And I will say, um, while nobody wants this kind of a challenge ever, the reality is it's become, it was a great opportunity of getting our firefighters, along with local government, local fire districts, community members, out on the ground um, to help reduce that flooding, which we know as soon as they finish packing those bags and taking care of the waters, the fires will come. And now at least they've been working closer together, more collaboratively um, as one team. You know, it's a part of the approach that I brought to this agency, which is really about this context of all lands, all hands, that we have to be working more effectively together with every one of our communities, our local governments, our state agencies, and our federal agencies in the face of fire, because we cannot do it alone, given what we have seen. Um, the reality is yesterday was a big reminder for me that we actually have to think even more largely. Um, we also know that besides wildfires, we have landslides, we have tsunami threats actually, we have earthquake threats, we have a flooding, we have an enormous amount of challenges across the state and our agency has the ability to come together since it knows how to do incident command, it knows how to get on the ground in middle crisis. So we are going to be looking to create a new frame, which is all lands, all hands, all risks. We're going to be working across the, uh, our state, across our communities, across our state agencies and our local to be able to provide the resource and capacity that our communities need far more because um, they are, have very limited resources, as we know. Um, that was much of the challenge that Okanagan County was facing with this flooding, is very little equipment, very little resources. Um, but I think that is one of our key responsibilities. And as the Commissioner of Public Lands, who supervises the state's largest firefighting force, we recognize we have to do more than just fight fires. Um, and we have to be able to set ourselves up for the increasing fire seasons. This area, as people know, seasons like 2014 and 2015 burned a million acres. And yesterday, as I was driving through, I looked through the landscape as I drove to Okanagan and to OMAC and to Riverside and saw thousands and thousands of those acres that were burned in the 2014 and 2015 fires that cost the state over $500 million alone. We have to take bigger, bolder action on forest health. We have to recognize we can't do it alone and we have to bring our different agencies together to bear along with all of the property owners and community members like you. Um, so a big piece of what we're going to be doing, I'm going to talk about my top priorities in forest health and where we've gotten with those. Um, and I think that's what you guys are here to talk about a lot. And this is what's really pleasing for me because we have to elevate this conversation. So first and foremost, forest health is one of my top priorities. I like that. That was actually good. Am I dismissed? <laughs> okay, never mind. All right, go, go, go. So 
So last year, for those who don't know, we launched, I'm glad you saw the Air Mega Fires. I've had three opportunities to see Paul and his film. i got to tell you, it wakes everybody up. We need to have that playing in every single community in Washington State, including the western part of our state. But last year we launched uh, our first 20-year forest health plan for Washington State. Um, this plan is focused on eastern part of our state first. Um, it puts forward a bold and ambition plan that we will be treating. Two point, we have 2.7 million acres of unhealthy forest. That's state, federal, and tribal lands as well as private lands. Half of that is federal lands. Um, that is a significant amount of acreage that we have to cover just on the east part of our state. So we put together a plan that would now focus on um, being able to treat 1.25 million acres over the next 20 years. It's about 70,000 acres a year in our state. Um, it makes sure and recognizes that we have to do it in a strategic way, not just pilot project after pilot project. And we are now uh, growing our internal forest health team. We're literally standing up an entire program within our agency on forest health. You'll see and hear from many of our people who are helping build that program. The goal of it is that we're going to be uh, looking at a watershed by watershed level, identifying the highest priority landscapes based on the condition of the forest and the close proximity to people, and then developing a plan of what are the specific treatments that need to happen on that landscape, and not doing it just by state land only, but looking at the whole watershed and the diversity of ownership, knowing that fire and forest health do not look at boundaries. Um, we've got to operate the same way. Um, we're going to, in that context, be building up at a rapid pace and scale like we've never seen before. And it's going to be difficult, it's going to be challenging, and it's going to take every one of you in this room, not only in looking at your own lands and what needs to happen, but in starting to have the conversations. The conversations with your community, the conversations with local government, the conversations with the state legislature. We've got to make our state private and federal forests in Washington State healthier, make them more resilient to wildfire, and also see the opportunities that it can provide for local economies, for jobs, for recreation, and for habitat. Our biggest challenge after doing this is that we still have to do a forest health plan for the western part of our state. Majority of this state believes, the people on the ground believe that the forest health crisis is something for only one half of our state. And the reality is, as I talk about fires later, we know that isn't the case. The western part of our state is also facing significant forest health challenges. But there's a whole education that needs to happen um, to make sure the western part of the state is rising to it and that we can get on top of it faster. We have made huge progress in the context of forest health with the legislature. Um, one of the first things I recognize coming into office is that the legislature has to be a partner with us. We are not effective if we don't have their understanding, their support, and their engagement on the issues that we have. Um, last year we were fortunate. We were able to secure a capital budget. It did come nine months late, but I will take that. Um, we were able to get $13 million to begin to attack this forest health issue and to be able to get on the ground. I will give you a perspective that $13 million in the beginning phase of this will only get us to 15,000 acres. Remember I said 70,000 acres need to be treated a year. Um, with we great thing is we're already putting these funds to work. Our goal is going to be trying to make sure that we can build that scale at a faster pace. Every time you try to build a program, you know it takes a while to get it up and going. You got to do all the analysis, the planning. You got to build the team. Um, but our goal is that once we get it going, we'll be able to be much faster at doing those forest health treatments. Um, so at the beginning part, you guys should know that we were effective in the legislature to, one, build a prescribed burn program. This is an area that historically was something our agency in the state welcomed and utilized. I love the first speaker we had who talked about the context of fire and the importance of fire and not being afraid of it. Um, I wish I could bring my three boys out more on the landscape. They certainly don't seem to be afraid of it at all, but just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we need to get more of that youthfulness in, in front of everybody. Uh, but we have lost a lot of that expertise and training, and we were fortunate to get some funding from the legislature to start to build a prescribed burn program. I urge people to be patient as we try to get the people on the ground and we get them trained. We also need people to be helping spread the word to the community members, because I've already, last year we did a prescribed burn within Roslyn after the fire, 
And before the fires had even gone out in the Roslyn, Tanaway area, I already had community members calling me going, wait a minute, we got fire on the landscape. These people are starting it. That's exactly what we wanted. We wanted that on the landscape intentionally by the people in the right area with the right weather conditions. But it's going to take all of you helping spread that word because otherwise we could find ourselves moving forward only to be pushed significantly back if we get the wrong um, blowback, if I can say. We also have $4 million out of this capital budget um, for private small forest landowners just like you to restore the health through cost sharing, to incentivize them forest health treatments. To reach, for, reach private landowners is not easy, right? Um, it's great you're all assembled here. We're not going to let you leave the room till you sign up for the program. Just kidding. But what really does need to happen is for you guys, $4 million and try to get that out on the ground in the next two years is not easy if the property owners aren't coming forward. And we're going to need you guys being able to look into it, identify if you're the right landowner to apply for that grant and apply for that funding, and also to spread the news to your neighbors, to share this so that we can get more people sign up. Um, next piece is federal lands. We know with the half of our 2.7 million acres in poor health being federal lands that federal agencies are absolutely critical in this piece. Um, we have a number of good news. The Good Neighbor Authority was signed back in March of 2017. I was honored to sign that. My goal is to try to be the number one state in this nation on the Good Neighbor Authority. Um, we have already um, been getting projects on the ground. Um, we have five uh, projects going forward right now in our national forest here in Washington State. The Good Neighbor Authority allows us, while well, we've got people already in our program able to do forest health treatment, let us get on the ground, let us do that work, and let's be able to get greater efficiencies and cost savings for the federal government and be able to get more resources um, on the ground to do the forest health treatment if we're already there. We believe these projects will deliver several million board feet of timber this year alone to local mills and communities that have been starved of federal timber for a long time. Um, and here's the great part. We were able to work with the legislature to set up a revolving loan account that enables us, as we generate revenue from those forest health treatments, it goes into a revolving loan account, which then we can leverage that money to go do additional projects. Um, I think with, we all know, Congress helped address that that fire borrowing problem, which is huge. It's a significant uh, win where instead of stealing from or borrowing from the forest health to pay for wildfire, we now know that we're going to have a protected amount of money ready. The great thing is Washington State being ahead and the Good Neighbor Authority enables us to already be getting those funds early and getting on the ground improving the effectiveness of Washington State. So that will be a huge deal. Um, for us to be getting that work done and also being able to create a significant amount of revenue that continues to go for additional projects because we know we've got a long way to go with the federal lands. Wildland fire, you know, I've got to say um, I'm concerned about this year. Last year was a pretty good year compared to many of the ones we've had in the past. I'm concerned, though. Um, much of the what we're hearing is 2015 fires are likely to be what we see this year. I'm hopeful that isn't, but we know that our fires have gotten significant. We've already had 119 fires alone this year. We know that the fires are coming earlier. The fire season's lasting longer. The size of the fires are getting greater. And that what we saw 20 years ago in the fire area is nothing like what we have right now. And 20 years from now, in 2030, the wildfire conditions will be nothing like what we see here. This has got to be a top priority for us to be setting ourselves up for success. So starting last year, we took a very uh, clear new approach to wildfire that said, our goal is going to be try to keep the fires um, controlled so that we don't get them out of control and then they're burning at the wrong time of year and costing the kinds of millions of dollars that we saw in 2014 and 2015. So the first thing we did is we knew we had to leverage our air assets. And we began putting them and pre-positioning them in those key areas that we knew were going to have significant fire conditions based on weather reports, based on the forest health, and also based on the um, close proximity to communities. We leveraged those air assets early and got them on the landscape quickly. Now here's my challenge. I've received, we've received little to nothing on wildfire suppression in our budgets. While forest health, we are growing that from the legislature. It's been a huge new boom. 
we still sit between zero to a million dollars a year at best on wildfire suppression. The problem is, I have, here's an example on air assets. I have seven helicopters. Historically, I leveraged those helicopters on the eastern central part of the state where fires happen. It was much easier, but now I've got to figure out how to distribute across the state because we're seeing wildfires on the west, and we haven't been able to have the research and equipment to be able to tackle the entire state on wildfires. And I will tell you, my biggest concern for this year is actually the west part of our state and whether we have the resources and equipment in those forests that we knew are struggling, but the communities aren't necessarily aware of how big the problem is. In addition to that, we also recognize the, the fact that we've got to pre-position equipment throughout the state in those areas because if we got the equipment there local to the fire, it doesn't take us four hours to get on the ground. Um, we were able to last year, pre and we're going to do it again this year, pre-position equipment in those areas we know, separate just from our air assets, but fire equipment, because many of our local fire districts have limited resourcing capacity. We have also were able to work with the legislature to get um, a grant program that enables us to take our surplus fire equipment and be able to get it to those communities that have the least amount of resources and the greatest amount of potential risk from fires. It was a huge, huge deal last year. I delivered um, up in, um, in Chisaw, literally, uh, they helped solve the nine mile um, fire that was huge in 2015. Uh, it was their fire district alone with limited resource and capacity because we were spread so thin across the state. That morning I delivered that fire truck was the morning their fi only fire truck died. And the reality is they don't have an answer, right? They don't, it's a volunteer fire district. They're making do with limited resources on a massive landscape. We've got to find ways that we're working more closely and helping support our local governments and our local communities. And that's one of the things that we've done is we are now um, really truly partnering in a much more effective and aggressive way. First, we are training all of our firefighters together, and we're training them earlier. So not just state agency firefighters training, but we're bringing the feds and the local firefighters. So we're meeting before we even get on the line. We know how to communicate. We know how to coordinate. We've built our relationships. In addition to that, we're also building the 20-year wildfire plan, the first one our state has done that one looks past a five-year term and looks out full 20 years of what do we need to do to fully equip our agency and our state to be prepared for fires that we know are likely 20 years from now. In that 20-year strategic plan, we did not just say, what does DNR need to do to set itself up for success? We knew we needed to bring the entire state, all of our leaders together on that, all of our agencies, all of our local communities and governments. And so we're now building a 20-year wildfire plan that has every from National Guard, BLM, U.S. Forest Service, state MOBs, state DNR, the emergency management team, as well as local fire districts being able to develop a plan. The goal with that 20-year wildfire plan is that we will not only be building our teams together as the time goes on so that we're more effective year after year, but it also is the case that we now, when we go to the legislature, we have a clear plan about what each one of our agencies needs. And when we go to Congress, what each one of our agencies needs to make sure we're setting ourselves up. I think this is going to be a huge deal, not only for the state, but I think it will position us well, given that we see across the nation many, many states that are struggling just as we are with fires. Um, so I, I guess the big message I want you guys to take away is the way we're looking at this, and it's proving successful. Last year we had 96% of our fires were kept to 10 acres using that approach that we took. Um, we know that the 4%, though, threw up enormous amount of smoke and a lot of fire on the landscape still, as those know, uh, close to Jolly Mountain, close to North Peak, close to Diamond Creek, um, not very far from here. Um, and the goal here is that we've got to be operating very much in a context of one state, one community, one fire, all of us working together effectively to be ready. I think this is a vision that is, includes our public lands, includes our private lands, it includes our federal lands, that if we can actually work more collectively together to manage sustainably, we can also ensure the long-term health of our environment, our economy, and our communities. It's a vision that the agency, the Department of Natural Resources, and the people everywhere throughout this agency is behind and is supporting and looks forward to working with all of you to do. Um, 
I want to close just by one last key priority that you should know about if you haven't. Um, last year, I also launched a new effort called the Rural Community Partnership Initiative at the agency. And many people in my agency said, wait, what? What do we do with, what? How do we, what? What do we have to do with rural economic development? And I said, well, you generate $325 million a year for this state and its economy. You generate $125 million for your schools in this state. You manage 6 million acres of land that is in the most rural communities of our state that is based on our breadth of natural resource lands that our state presents. And we believe that as we look around this state, back to my first mention of got weed, got ammo, okay, that throughout this state we have rural communities that have been struggling for a very long time that we can go through the central Puget Sound and see an unbelievable economic boom that show, makes a lot of people forget there was a recession. Um, but the reality is, in our rural communities, they are still being hit from the depression and then all the economic and other environmental challenges that have happened in that community. That recession for them was just another blip that caused another hit. And there hasn't been a bounce back. I believe at the state, Department of Natural Resources, because of the breadth of land we manage, because the lands we manage are in every single county of the state, in the most rural and urban communities, that we actually have a true responsibility to grow and strengthen those communities' economies. And then in doing so, we will actually better serve our beneficiaries, will better serve our state. And in doing that, though, we need to be intentional. We need to not just say, yes, we contribute. This is how much we contribute. We need to say, here's the lands that we bring to this equation. How do we help support your community? What is the infrastructure investments that you need? What is the opportunities? And how do we be a partner with you in doing that? Last year when we launched that, uh, we were able, within six months, to bring forward over 88 projects from around this state in every single community. From broadband up here in Okanagan, where we have a challenge of just being able to communicate during fires with our own people, to the universities and libraries and schools and, and job centers who don't have access. So how can we grow and strengthen that? We have enormous amount of projects that have come forward. And the reason, and I can talk more about it, but the, I urge you guys to think about how you might be able to bring forward a project knowing your community knowing your organization. And what we're trying to do is really get it coming from the community so they're invested in it, they know what's best, and we can be a partner with them. We've already uh, launched a number of projects that we've already selected that are already making great progress. And one of the other things we do is we work well with the legislature, so we're able to get oftentimes funding and investments that can go um, and help that community even stronger. So let me just close, because I know you guys are dying to have questions and answers or wait for the next speaker. Um, you know, President Eisenhower once said that whatever America hopes to bring to pass to the world must first come to pass in the heart of America. Um, in so many ways, from resilience in the face of challenges like wildfires, drought, floods, and changing rapidly economy, to the growing the food we eat and the wood that provides our housing, our buildings, and the people who care for the lands, in our state at every single level, and that's all of you who are on it every single day. Rural Washington and our timber towns truly represents, I believe, the heart of this state. It's why our communities that depend on our natural resources are so important. And unfortunately, I think we need to raise and elevate that story of how important our natural resource communities are and our natural resource lands are to the long-term mm -hmm. health of every single human being in this state. It's a place where I believe when Washington's rural economies are healthy and strong, actually, this state can be healthy and strong. It's a place where we all come together and support and work closely with each other, and we end the kinds of divisions that we've seen from east versus west to urban versus rural. And that this, in doing so, if we can actually be able to bring that marriage together, we can start to work more closely together, where we can understand not only our own communities, but other communities, that we are actually going to make rural Washington the strongest, healthiest part that will actually ensure that the rest of our state, who doesn't necessarily understand us and the importance of what we do every single day to help them succeed, 
will be a partner with us. I look forward to working with you to make that happen. I thank you for your leadership and what you do every single day to protect the beautiful parts of Washington State and ensure, because I know it's hard work, it's not easy, and oftentimes it's taken for granted unfairly. So thank you again.